before we read the passage, I want to highlight something I'm going to use as an illustration later in the sermon. And it's ministry shares. I haven't talked a lot about ministry shares since I've been here, really. Um, but ministry shares, what was that? How many of y'all know what ministry shares are? How many have no clue whatsoever? That's, that's good, right? All right. So our denomination, the Christian Reformed denomination, is about 150, 60 years old, somewhere in there. And pretty much from the get-go, they realized that there is a need for certain denominational things, especially at, like the seminary. And uh, so every every church agreed to pay a certain amount to the denomination so that we could do some things together. Fast forward 150 years, and uh, they're no longer called quotas. It used to be like the quota you had to pay. Now it's ministry shares, a little bit more positive. Right? And it's an opportunity for us, each local church, to give to the denomination so that we, as a Christian Reformed church, can do more together than we can ever do apart. Right? And they used to have some long, nice brochure, and they don't print it anymore. So this is what I could find, but it's still a really good brochure. It says, you add, God multiplies, which is true in everything, right? He isn't God fills it up. So what we do as a denomination is far more than what we could do as an individual church. And there's a list of the things in the back of there. Some of them are more denominational ministries, like synod, um, grace relations, pastor church relations, disability concerns. And some of them are more outreach ministries in a sense, like uh, world missions, home missions, which is, uh, well, we have a, someone who knows a little bit about home missions here. Um, Christian Reform World Missions, uh, Faith Alive is uh, publishing, Calvin Seminary, Calvin College, Back to God, our ministries, all around the world. So the main thing is, there's these great ministries that we support through ministry shares. And it truly is a tremendous opportunity to do that. Now, here's the, here's the quiz. See if my slide is in the right spot. Uh, so here's the quiz. So ministry shares are determined, and this is some careful qualification because there's money involved, so they have to be detailed. Ministry shares are determined per adult, confessing, attending, member. So that means that per adult, confessing, attending, member that we have at church here, we count them up, and then we give to the denomination, we're supposed to give to the denomination, a certain amount based on each adult attending profession. So if you're here and you haven't made a pass of faith, or you're not Member, or you're a member and you never come, that doesn't count. But if you're here, okay, you get the point. So, guess how much money we're supposed to give, any, every church is supposed to give to the denomination for adult professing attending member. Any guesses? And don't, if you know the answer, don't say it. That's not good. So, just guess if you don't know the answer. Any ideas? 13 what? 13 dollars 30 cents? Okay, a little high. A little high. Anybody else? Per year. Per year. 300? What do you think, Robbie? 5,000. 5,000. I feel kind of like Price is Right. This is more awesome. <laughs> often. And who said 300? We should have them come up and try to bribe them. All right, so per member per year, it's $388.79. $80 of that is for Calvin College. The rest of that is for the nominations. This goes down the further you get it away you get but it's $388. That means that if a church was going to do this, from our offering as families and adult professional attending members, we would take $388 of what we all give and we send it to the denomination. Now, there's one more quiz here. How about classes? So classes is a group of Christian from churches in this area. We're supposed to give a certain amount to them also. Anybody know what that is? Well, does anybody know? Anybody guess? area ministries, and we can get grants and classes. That's probably how we started the coffee spot. So we're also supposed to give a certain amount of money. Uh, this adds up. I think I put this here. So we have 176 adult professing and attending members. Now, they all don't attend at once, but that's the idea. So we would give $68,000 to the denomination and $3,745 to classes for info. Now, my hope is that over the next year, two years, whatever, we can highlight these ministries more and more and more. And you can get on the internet, the interweb, as I like to call it sometimes, and you can research these ministries and, and their fabulous, amazing, wonderful things. And as a denomination, we are far stronger than some because we're good at organization. <coughs> it's one of our strengths. And there's just astounding things happening. One thing I could highlight is, um, well, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. There's 
great things happening. Now we've got to go to our text. And I use this later, so keep this in mind as an illustration for the teaching in our text today. So let's go to our text. I'm going to read Malachi chapter 3, 1 through Then suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by, as in the former years. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice, but do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O Lord, and Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, I will re return. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw up open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. This is a challenging passage, and uh, every time I preach on giving, which is reasonably often, but I get seven or eight months, I guess, I think about this. This is what I thought this week coming up to. So I'm going to get up, and I'm now standing up in front of you, and my challenge to you is simply this. Whatever income you get, take that income, divide it into ten parts, and give the first part to God. That means that if you make $1,000, what I'm asking you to do is to give $100 to God. If you make $10, to give $1. And that's a significant challenge, because I'm, I mean, it seems kind of normal. We talk about it, but really... During the week, if you would hear an ad on TV from some nonprofit or some agency or even some product that say, give 10% of your money to this thing, you'd be like, yeah, right, I don't think that's going to happen. But literally, that's the teaching here. Give 10%, and not only 10%, the first 10% of your income to God, to the church, to nonprofits, perhaps, to people around you. Just give it away. And the main qualification is give it away in such a way that it doesn't benefit you at all. That's a ridiculous teaching, especially when you think about culture. But that's what I'm asking you to do. And if I'm going to ask you to do that, I realize that I have just somehow described a very, very clear benefit of doing that. And so um, what I'd like to do this morning is actually have you be part of the illustration. I'd like to have this half of the church get up if you're able and just sort of stand on this side of the church. And I'd like to have this half of the church get up again if you're able and stand on this side You don't have to crowd in, you don't have to all be right in the aisle, but the general idea is we can look at each other. And this is good that some people stay in the middle, because the reality is we're all over there just hanging out. Alright, so, uh, so Calvary has an interesting history of giving, and I'm not going to drag up the past too often, but every once in a while it's interesting. I guess there was a survey done quite a few years ago. And it was a self-identified survey. This was like 10, 15 years ago. And the survey was, do you tithe? And the answer was 3% of the people at Calvary tithed at that time. That's, uh, that's not, not, not so great. Um, that was a long time ago. And who knows if that was accurate or if it was just a poorly administered survey. We don't know. But uh, about five years ago, apparently, uh, someone was looking at, at who tithes at Calvary. And about half, about half the church uh, gave significant amounts of tithing or not, we don't know exactly, but about half the church gave. Now, recently, this, this week actually, we were looking at how many people in church 
sort of percentage-wise, give probably something close to a tithe, or at least some very, very intentional amount. And the good news is, it's about 90-95% of you here give some percent, some significant amount. That's pre-planned, uh, faithful, like steady every week, every other week, or every month. I mean, you do that. That's pretty good. That's amazing. And I think, honestly, I don't know if we should give ourselves a hand for tithing, but let's just do that, because it's just amazing. Notice that we're getting a church in hand, not any one member, right? Because that's, that's always a bad idea. We don't get praise for giving money. But the thing is, it's amazing. Now, are we all given exactly the whole tithe to the church? I don't know. I said this before, I'm not terribly legalistic about this because uh, there's all sorts of great opportunities. But the thing is, we should give a significant amount of money to our local church. That's benefiting us, that we're part of, because it's good spiritually, right? But this is the illustration. This is the illustration. Wherever you are at, let's just pretend that there's two kinds of people in the world, right? And let's, for this illustration this morning, pretend that these are the people that give a full tithe. For some reason or other, God has led these people, they've experienced blessing. They just give a full tithe every single paycheck they get, every amount of money they get. They just give a whole, the whole tithe to somebody. Give it away. It doesn't benefit them in any way. But let's say, and I feel bad about this, but let's say that you're the group. It just doesn't, right? It just doesn't. I know it's not true, but it just doesn't give. You haven't felt led to. You haven't felt able to. The money's simply too tight, and you just don't give, and maybe you've never been convicted. Who knows what? But you're, you're believers, but you just don't. And this is true, right? Some people give. Some people don't. A lot of us are in the middle. The reason I had to stand this way is because this is what also I think is true. I would bet that if we would look at the group of people that doesn't tithe, we would also be able to hear stories from them how money is always chronically short. There's never enough money left at the end of the month. There's always too much month left at the end of the money. There's always too many bills. Things pile up. Things break. It just seems like nothing ever works completely 100% financially. I would suspect that's true because that was true in my own life. And I think as I talk to people, that's often true. If we don't tithe those of us who are following Jesus Christ, often we simply never have enough money. And if we go over here to this group and we say, okay, people who tithe all the time, uh, what's your story about financial and you know, how does this all work? What we probably find out is that there's always enough resources. I mean, they're not paying, may not be a lot, but somehow the bills always end up eventually getting paid. Somehow God brings things into your life in such a way that it cannot be financed, but there's always enough resources. And this is what the text says. The text actually says, test me in this and see, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. He says, this is the deal. We know that people, ourselves, sometimes aren't tithing. He says, test me. Test me and see what happens. Now this is a challenge. I'll just tell you stand for a little bit more and then I'll let you sit down again. This is a challenge because sometimes in life we just have too many expenses. Some of us do not make very much money and I don't want you to not feed your kids. I don't want you to not pay your bills. I don't want you to take your whole check and give it to the church because actually the church is doing fine. But I want to preach this for your spiritual benefit. Now I think most of the people that tithe have a story similar to Marsha's and I. I can't remember all the details so, but the main point is this. At some point, Marsha and I, early in our marriage, we took a financial uh, freedom course, and we got challenged to tithe. So we went home, looked at our finances, and figured out what a tithe would be. And it turns out that we were making about $300 a month. We were renting a house for $350, so I'm not sure how all this works. But we were eating out of food pantry, we had a $20 budget for all the, every week, and we ate a lot of turkey burger, and it was rolled, you know, cut off the ends, and that was our, that was food. So it was pretty good, actually, the food pantry was pretty good. Um, but we were making so little money, but we looked at it and thought, okay, we're going to sacrificially give $20. And that was hard. And I think we started at 5% actually and tested God to see if that would work. And eventually it worked so well that we just went up to 10% right away. So the point is this. Test the NC. How can we grow in this? How can we get wherever we're at to a full 10% to experience God's blessing? And the answer is gradually. God says to test him and see. See if he is good. See if he provides in extraordinary because the blessing, really, as God says, is over here. So I'm going to let you sit down, and we're going to, we're going to keep going in this test. Thank you. As we keep going in this test, I want to point out a couple things. That's the 
opportunity to move from not giving to giving to experience God's blessing. But when we don't give, we're offending really two people, two groups of people. One is your people. In this text and in the Bible, almost every time giving is brought up, it's connected to issues of justice and mercy and caring for very particular people. And in this passage, too, here it is. He says, I will be quick to testify against people who are sorcerers. And let me just ask you, do sorcerers care about other people? We don't know many sorcerers, but do sorcerers? No, they don't care about that. Sorcerers care about power and about manipulation and about abuse. Sorcerers are not nice people. Adulterers, do adulterers care about other people? I think they care about one person, but really, adulterers care about themselves and their own needs. Um, or false needs. Perjurers, do perjurers care about other people? People who steal money don't care about other people. Do people who defraud laborers of their wages care about other people? No. Those who oppress people, those who oppress widows, they don't care about other people. Those who deprive foreigners among you of justice, they don't care about other people. And so what God is doing in this passage is connecting the fact that if you don't give, what you're saying to other people is that you don't care about other people. And then this passage that Jesus has in the New Testament that's related to this is this. He says, basically, woe to you teachers and Pharisees and hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and this really popped for me when I read this last week because what's happening is these Pharisees have this garden and they got this mint, dill, and cumin, and they have to tithe on it, right? Because it's the first fruit. So they carefully clip stuff off, they bring it up to the temple, and they fulfill all righteousness giving to the temple. But really, what God is saying, what Jesus is saying, you don't care about other people. And so this is connected to other people. All the time, our giving is always connected to other people. So this summer, more and more, last summer too, maybe, but this summer, you see those people on the corner when you drive in at intersections, right? And they're out of money and they have a cardboard sign and they basically say, help me. Right? And every time I drive up, I think of the story of the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. And I'm thinking, the Bible teaches that we should care about people that have gotten beat up by life when we try to buy them. And almost every time I keep on driving, I buy them. Because I think it's my time, I often just carry cash, I think that they really need it, I think I'm helping other people. But it hits my conscience every single time. I should be doing something. Because, I mean, the analogy in the Bible is right there, right? Whatever it is, whatever it is, when we choose not to give, whether we choose not to give on the corner, or whether we choose not to give at church, or whether we choose just not to give at all anywhere, what we're saying to people, whether it's as obvious as there in the street corner, or whether it's as it's more hidden, what we're saying is we don't care about people. And more importantly, God says, when you don't give at all, you don't care about people. That's what these passages say. If you keep all your money to yourself, you don't care about people. And now, of course, we don't think this. Remember, before I went to seminary, I was working um, at Pella Windows, and I was making a fair bit of money, and uh, a lot, actually, for the time, and for my skill level, perhaps. But uh, I was getting these big checks, and then I would give nothing away. I would... I think a couple of weeks I made like $1,000 at work, after taxes, and I'd go into church and I have a 10 in my wallet and put a 10 in the offering plate and think I'd done something pretty good, right? That was sacrificial. Come on. I wasn't actively saying that, but what I was saying by my actions, by my inaction, I don't care about people. I care about me, my own hopes, my desires, my, my hope to get more and more income. It's messed up. That's what we're saying. But the passage also says here, and this is what struck me the last time I preached on this, but the passage also says, if you don't give, what you're telling God is that you don't care about God. It's not what you mean to say, but by your inaction, what you're saying is, well, I don't really care about you. And this is what God says, return to me, and I will return to you. You ask, how are we to return? And then he says this, where a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing him? And tithes and offerings. So when we don't give, what happens is that we're hurting, we're hurting God. A while back, I, uh, <laughs> I won't tell his name, but we had a friend up on Bay Street who would stop by every once in a while, and we always had a good laugh because he was just a funny guy. But at one point, he told me when he was young, he used to break into houses, and uh, he would smash the window and jump in the house and take the electronics and pawn them, and it was great fun. Him and his friends would do this. I don't know, it's what they did on the weekends for fun. But then one day, he, uh, he smashed the window and jumped into the house, and for some reason, this lady had her bed on the main floor, right, where he jumped in the house at. And she sat up and looked at him with a look of complete terror in her eyes. And I thought the story would go differently, but what my friend said is he saw that look, and it changed him, because he realized that he was terrorizing people, and he never did it again. At some point, at some point, we're tithing. He 
we've got to realize what we're doing. We've got to realize that we're bringing God. We've got to see his face and it sort of looks of dismay and the hurt with the pain on it.
by the way, don't eat other people's bananas. That's bad, too. <laughs> Give it away. It breaks the power of greed, and he invites us to step into some amazing, awesome blessings. So the illustration is about ministry shares. I could tell you some story about someone who learned to give and experience a blessing, and that's very appropriate. It's certainly true in my own life. But the illustration is actually about our church. Because in the past, we haven't given very many ministry shares. For 20 or 30 years, I understand the church didn't give anything to the denomination. We maybe gave some stuff to men's missionaries, but when it came time each year to determine if we were, we were going to give stuff to our denomination, the answer was, no, we can always use it for ourselves a little bit better. And you know what happened in the finances here at church? The wheels came off. And every year, the finance team had to figure out how to knock it down, Last year, we've given more than ever, well, more than recently anyway, to the denomination. We've given 22,000 to the denomination and about 1,500 classes. And with that, of course, there's a lot of stuff going on. With that, God has blessed us in extraordinary, extraordinary ways as we've learned to give away to others. We've paid off the debt. We're able to allow like 10 organizations to use our facility. And God is beginning to give life financially, especially partly because you also have been convinced. This is true for a church. This is true for all of us. If we hold on to our money, it just slips through our fingers. But if we give, as God has asked us to give, we experience life and we experience blessing in that area as we've never experienced it before. I just have a couple things I want to share here at the end. But just to sort of whet your appetite, this is probably the book that I would write if I wrote books, but it's written better than I would write it. It's uh, Jeff Mannion, and it's cheap on Amazon. You only have to pay a lot for it. It's such a good book talking about how the first challenge, how it, it's challenging to first give at the beginning, and then you start giving, and pretty soon ten percent becomes easy, and you just keep the ninety, and then you think this is uh, this is all good, and it kind of becomes empty, and you got to realize it's all of it's God, and then it talks about what happens when you actually have wealth, and so it just takes you through the journey. It's a great, fabulous, fabulous book. Nelson Mandela's birthday would have been this week, and this is a quote that popped up on Google, and I thought, this is so true. What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lives. It's what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. I think what he's saying is, you don't get bonus points for living, right? That's kind of the standard baseline. You don't get bonus points for having houses and filling them up with nice stuff. You don't get bonus points for buying a nice phone, a nice car, a nice, I don't know, phone, whatever it is you like. You don't get bonus points for that. What you get bonus points for, so to speak, is living your life in such a way that every area that you bless other people, and that includes finances. Are you blessing other people? Or are you just blessing yourself? This is from John 14, and I shared this last week too. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, some of us have this commandment so we don't quite keep it. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest my So many of us serve God in so many areas that somehow leave God out of our hands. And what the invitation here is, is to invite God into our finances so he can manifest himself to us in our finances. Yes, it's a challenge. Take it step by step. Take for things at a time. But yes, it's a huge challenge to invite God into our finances by giving the first fruits of our money, of our resources away. But what God promises is that he will manifest in your finances and in the finances of the people around you and you experience blessing like never, never before. Sometimes your money may multiply. Sometimes you may just experience God's provision in astounding ways. Sometimes it may be huge. Sometimes it might be small. But God will demonstrate his love to you in these areas. It was a simple illustration. I don't want to trivialize it, but it was a very simple illustration. A while back, uh, actually a couple weeks ago, we were talking, Marsh and I were talking behind the house, and there's a little bit of cement back there. And we were just thinking, you know, it'd be nice to buy a patio cover or build something that would keep the sun off because it's kind of bright sometimes. And it could be a nice patio if there was something over it. But and she was dreaming about what we could buy, and I was kind of like, you know what, I just want the finances. I'm like, we're not buying houses. It ain't going to happen. We're giving so much away, and she feels convicted about that. We're not buying houses. She's like, oh, okay, we'll wait. And uh, so we, okay, we'll wait. The next day we were going to the gyms. 
outing, and on the way there, we saw an umbrella. It's sitting by the side of the road. And she's like, I think that boy found an umbrella. So I turned it on, and we stopped there. It said free, so we figured she'd take it. It said free. And I threw it in her van, and we take it home. And it turns out it's this, it's this uh, umbrella where you crank it up, and it has one arm, this huge umbrella comes up. I've never seen anything like it, right? It's just amazing. It's a little old, little worn. But it works great. Here's the thing. I don't know what your need is. I don't know where God's calling you. I don't know where your finances are. If he's calling you to give 2%, 10%, 30% or more. But here's the thing. When we take steps of faithfulness and invite God into our lives, we experience little things like that much, much more importantly. So the simple question is, would you take steps of faithfulness to be where God has a need to call you to go? Let's pray. Father God, Step into our lives and show us exactly what that's like to live in your life in this area. And I pray for miracles, honestly. I pray for miracles. I know there's so many people in church that are struggling. The last thing I want to do is have to give more money away than I have enough money. So Lord, so I pray for miracles. That you provide as only you can provide. That we invite you into these areas of our lives and you just do amazing things. We'd be able to share touch points with each other about huge miracles. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness and for your restoration. In Jesus' name we pray.